Hello everyone, Hyper here and welcome to the Big Dumb Strats video for Mythic Ilganoth. In this guide, I'll cover everything you need to know to take on this encounter and we'll talk a little bit about both strategies, the no dispel strategy and the dispel strategy and what the benefit and downside of each one is. If you prefer reading your guides, you can also find this over on Wowhead, the link to which is in the description box. But without further ado, let's get started. The mythic change for this encounter is very significant and it's what makes this encounter so difficult and that is the addition of the cursed blood mechanic. The main mechanic of this debuff is that it will deal damage to the player and anyone within the indicator circle around the player. However, this indicator circle will shrink and grow in size and the amount of damage the debuff deals will actually change based on the size of the circle. So whenever the circle is at its maximum size, it will deal its maximum damage. When the circle shrinks to its minimum size, the debuff will deal its minimum damage. And this works both ways. It deals the damage to the player, and if the debuff happens to get dispelled, it will deal the same damage to the entire raid. So for example, if a debuff is dispelled at its maximum size, it will likely cause a wipe. However, if the debuff is dispelled at its minimum size, then that will just deal a fair amount of damage to the raid that can be healed back up, but shouldn't cause a raid wipe. The biggest issue is that the only way you can tell how much damage the debuff will do is by actually using your eyes and looking at the circle. There's no weak auras and no shortcuts that can help out your healers with deciding when to dispel. So if you're doing a dispel strategy where you try to get rid of all of these debuffs, you will need assigned people to call out dispels based on the visual indicator of this circle. The second main change is the addition of an add which spawns in the intermission phases and that is the clotted corruption. Early on, whenever this boss was first downed, most guilds used three tanks just because this add dealt a fair amount of damage, however nowadays tanks have enough gear that using a two tank strategy should be plenty. This clotted corruption will pick the furthest target from itself and cast Absorbing Charge on them, which will deal damage to the player and will also absorb any Bloods of Nihilotha that are alive and in its path when it charges. And each time it absorbs a blood, the Clotted Corruption will deal more damage. So moving on to the strategy section, there's two predominant strategies for this fight. One is called the No Dispel strategy, which involves never dispelling any cursed bloods off the raid. Uh, which means that after the first phase, your entire raid will have a Cursed Blood debuff, which actually is quite risky because if one person dies, it usually triggers a chain reaction and your entire raid wipes. But the big benefit of this mechanic is that your healers never have to worry about dispelling, and the mind control mechanic that periodically happens in this encounter actually gets completely ignored because players who have the Cursed Blood debuff are not eligible to be mind controlled. This means that you will only need to deal with one set of mind controls in the very first phase, and then after that you will not have any more mind controls for the rest of the encounter. That is a huge upside. However, one of the big downsides of this strategy is that it requires a pretty specific healing comp, mostly stacking Holy Paladins, um, and it also requires your raid to be fairly limited on the number of melee DPS you use. Otherwise, they will simply run out of room, especially if they get targeted with Eye of Ilganaut, which further then reduces the amount of uh, space you have to work with within melee range of the boss. The second strategy is the Dispel strategy. The big upside of this is that it's way less comp reliant. You can typically have as many melee DPS as you want, um, and your healer comp is also less strict. You can pretty much bring any healer comp um, at this point in the expansion, but it does require your healers and certain people to make callouts on who to dispel each time based on the size of their circle and the amount of damage that the debuff will do to the raid. So how do you make the decision on which strategy you will go with? The biggest thing in my opinion is simply your raid comp. If you have let's say two holy paladins and you only have a few melee dps on your roster then the no dispel strategy is typically a little bit more favorable. It is a little bit higher risk, but especially nowadays, if no one is running above 40 corruption, so they're not at risk of dying to Thing From Beyond, 
then this strategy is not as risky as it was early on in the tier. However, if your roster doesn't have the required healing comp for it, or you have too many melee DPS, so DPS space is an issue, then I definitely recommend going with the Dispel strategy. This video will primarily focus on the No Dispel strategy, however, the only thing that really changes from the No Dispel to the Dispel strategy is what your healers need to do, which will be covered later in the healing section. Before you pull the boss, you will want to assign positions for all your ranged DPS and all your melee DPS, and ideally they will want to stick around the same position for the entire fight, except for the intermissions where they need to move to the organs to DPS them down. This is only really needed if you're doing the no dispel strategy because in that case the usable space is a lot more restricted because you don't want to overlap those cursed blood circles. For most of the encounter the two tanks will be facing the entrance of the room so that space is completely off limits but then anything else is usable real estate. In the first Ilganoth phase there will be only a few mechanics that you have to deal with. It will be two maybe three eyes of Ilganoth which are the little beams that come down and follow you around and one mind control mechanic. It's important to deal with the mind control mechanic quickly. Ideally you want to use a short stun on these targets and just burst them down. However you need to be very careful because nowadays people are doing so much damage that it's very easy to actually kill these targets after they come out of mind control. So we suggest the targets who do get mind controlled instantly use a personal cooldown after it times out because they will continue taking damage. For the first intermission, it doesn't matter which organ you pick to kill first, just pick either the one on the left side or the one on the right side. Uh, we start with the one on the right side and all of our melee DPS and ranged DPS move over to it and try to spread out fairly evenly just to avoid cleaving each other with those cursed bloods. In this phase, your two tanks will go to the corruption that is furthest from the one that you've targeted. So if you start on the right side, your two tanks should be over on the left side and they will just alternate interrupts on it. And your ranged DPS ideally should try to get interrupts on the middle organ. However, it's not that big of a deal if a few casts go off because at this point, there's not that many adds alive. So it's unlikely that you would get overwhelmed by missing a few interrupts. And then on the organ that everyone else is hitting, your melee DPS should just rotate interrupts and that should be fairly easy to get all of them. Now, after you've killed the first organ, it's time to move back to the Ilganaut phase. And if you're doing the no dispel strategy, everyone needs to be very careful not to run over each other and cleave each other with the cursed blood. It's very easy to try and hurry back to your position to start doing boss DPS, but especially if your circle is at max size, you will be doing a lot of damage to yourself and anyone else that you run over, so you need to be very careful with that. The second Ilganaut phase is actually easier than the first one because at this point there will be no more mind controls. Every single person in your raid should have the Curse Blood debuff and they should just be spread out and dealing boss DPS. Now after you push the boss um, to 0% once again, you can move into the second intermission phase. And at this point, everyone should move to the middle organ and just repeat what you did for the first organ. Since there are only two organs alive, your tanks should still go to the one that your raid is not hitting, and then the melee DPS can simply get the interrupts on the one that your raid is hitting. After the second organ is killed and you move on to the third Ilganoth phase, this is where your raid will start getting a more significant amount of bloods. And it's very important that at this point multi-daughters uh, make sure to dot them up and then if you're fixated by it, ideally you will want to position yourself in a way where the blood will actually run through the path of the boss which will allow it to just die to passive cleave. This is not always possible, so if a blood is fixating you and you have nowhere to kite it, just use a hard CC on it, such as a stun or a fear, and that will force it to refixate on someone else who ideally is on the opposite side of the boss. Keep in mind that there are several classes who are not able to deal with the bloods by themselves because they don't have any CC that will actually force them to refixate, so in that case it's important to call for help from someone else. Uh, several classes have spammable CC, such as Warlocks are able to fear them, um, and any class with a stun can also force these bloods to refixate. 
For the third intermission phase, you will only have one organ available and we typically have the entire raid funnel in there and DPS it down as quickly as possible. At this point, you will be getting so many bloods from the two organs that are already dead that your tanks don't really have any chance to get to the organ and help out. Instead, what your tanks are going to do is stand around the middle of the room and just try grouping up bloods and DPSing down bloods. We also suggest assigning a few ranged DPS who are particularly good at dealing with these bloods of Nihilota to just DPS them down, typically multi-daughters such as Shadow Priests, um, maybe Warlocks, or any other class who has an easy time dotting up and dealing damage to the bloods as well as the organ should help out in this phase. Also, if you are very heavy on melee, you can have one or two melee DPS stay out and try help out with the bloods instead of running to the organ to DPS it down. Right after the organ dies and you move on to the last Ilganoth phase, this is where the sketchiest part of the encounter happens. This is where you will have the most bloods alive, which means that once they start exploding, you will be taking the highest amount of raid damage. Your entire raid will have the cursed blood debuff, and also your tanks will be taking a pretty heavy amount of damage here. So as soon as that organ dies and your raid transitions back to position around the boss, you want to use bloodlust and ideally any raid-wide healing cooldowns just to make sure that everything is stable while the bloods get cleaned up and you start nuking the boss. If your raid has boomkins, it is highly advisable that they run mass entanglement. Um, and what we did initially is that we let two waves, or three waves rather, of adds come through. And then on the fourth wave, the boomkins started CCing them. So they would root them, and then when the second one came out, they would mass entangle them. And this essentially removed a few adds from the encounter completely which not only removes the need to CC them, it also removes some of the damage that is dealt to the entire raid whenever a blood explodes. The only issue with this is that if your DPS is a little bit too slow, you might run into the problem where they start enraging, um, and at that point they need to be kited out before they reach their targets um, and kill them. Once your raid sees a few bloods start enraging, they need to hard swap to them and DPS them down, or if it's towards the very end of the encounter, then you can have your Paladins cast Blessing of Protection on whoever that enraged blood is targeting, and that will prevent the person from taking too many stacks of the debuff that the bloods apply whenever they melee you. The last thing worth mentioning in the strategy phase is that in the last Ilganoth phase where you bloodlust, it is typically recommended to have your tanks stand in front of the middle organ instead of in front of the entrance or exit of the room. This is because for most of the fight, your tanks would have been positioned in the entrance of the room, which means that no one else was using that space to kite the beams, which then leads to having a pretty large area that is open and available for use, whereas the back of the room by the middle organ typically has a bunch of spots that are covered up with the Eye of Nazoth. So in that case, your tanks can just use that real estate because they don't really need that much space to move. And the people who are assigned to the back of the room can then switch to the front. So then they have a lot more space. And this also goes for your melee DPS, who will typically be severely restricted in this last burn phase of Ilganoth. For the damage section of this encounter, there is not all that much to talk about, mainly because all damage on this encounter is relevant damage, whether you're dealing it to Ilganoth himself or the organs in the intermission phase. For this reason, I recommend using your cooldowns as soon as they come up. The only time you should consider delaying your cooldowns for a little bit is if you're in the last intermission phase and your cooldowns are about to come up. In that case, you should delay them until the last Ilganoth phase whenever you pop Bloodlust or Heroism. One thing that's fairly important to mention is the positioning of your ranged DPS around the room. Ideally, you want your multi-daughters such as Shadow Priest, uh, Boomkins, Warlocks, anything along that line. You want them to be positioned near where the first organ is that you kill and the middle organ. This will allow them to get dots out on the Bloods of Nihilota as soon as you're done with the first wave of intermission. Classes who don't really benefit from multi-dotting or are unable to multi-dot, such as Fire Mages um, or Hunters, 
they should be placed towards the last organ because they don't really have a need to cast abilities into the bloods after they spawn. Instead, they will just keep doing boss damage and they will passively spread to any targets around it. One of the biggest things with the no dispel strategy is correct cooldown usage. With the no dispel strategy, whenever your circle reaches its max size, especially in the last phase, you will be taking a pretty significant amount of damage. So timing your health stone, health pot, and defensive cooldowns around your cursed blood debuff is actually quite important. And this goes for the intermission as well. If you're targeted by the charge from the clotted corruption and your debuff is close to reaching its max size, you will take a huge burst of damage. So you need to be very aware of that and either use a personal cooldown or call for your healers to focus some extra healing onto you. With the no dispel strategy, defensive cooldowns can be used a little bit differently. Depending on what kind of defensive cooldown you have, for example, Cloak of Shadows and Anti-Magic Shell and Immunities can be used to prevent the application of Cursed Blood or Immunities such as Divine Shield and Ice Block can also be used to completely dispel the Cursed Blood debuff. You just need to be very aware of when you press them because you want the debuff indicator to be as small as possible at the time that you try to dispel it. And defensive cooldowns that just provide a flat damage reduction should be used after you get mind controlled because you will continue taking damage even after the mind control is broken. Next for the healing section, one big thing that we need to cover is how your approach to the fight differs based on what strategy you use. For example, with the no dispel strategy, holy paladins are heavily favored because they have the rule of law talent, which allows them to reach targets that are super far away. And also most of their heals are mostly spot healing and don't require the players to actually be stacked up. Whereas if you were to take a healer such as a Resto Shaman and put him in the no dispel strategy, they will struggle quite a bit because most of their healing abilities do require your raid to be near each other to allow for those heals to bounce from person to person. With the no dispel strategy, you will have continuous damage throughout the raid and this damage will spike up and increase as the fight goes on because in addition to the cursed pulse damage which is essentially constant throughout the fight the hemorrhage damage will continuously ramp up as more and more bloods are spawned and subsequently killed throughout the fight on the other hand with the dispelling strategy the damage taken by the raid will spike from time to time each time a new wave of debuffs goes out and need to be dispelled. However, in, in between those waves, once all the debuffs have been dispelled, the raid will be taking very little damage, so it's a lot safer to stack up and move around. Um, and the healing cooldowns really only need to be allocated for whenever the raid is actually dealing with those dispels, rather than having to worry about consistently taking a high amount of damage. The number of healers you bring to this fight will depend on the strategy you use as well as what healing classes you have available. The no dispel strategy can be 3 healed and that is what we did early on in the expansion. One big reason for that however was because the enrage and the damage check was very tight on this encounter. However nowadays you can get away with bringing 4 healers just to cover more of the room and it's doubtful that you will run into any enrage issues. With the dispelling strategy, you absolutely want to have four healers and this will allow you to have, first of all, enough dispels to cover all of the people in the raid. And second of all, you will have enough healing cooldowns to help you survive each of those waves. One big thing to also keep in mind is that on this encounter, if you're not correctly moving around the room, you will have people who are out of range. If you're doing the dispelling strategy, your raid should try to move mostly as a unit, only spreading out whenever the mind controls happen, and then collapsing kind of to the same quadrant of the room, then rotating around with each of the organs and intermission phases. With the no dispel strategy, your raid will be spread out throughout the entire room for the entirety of the fight. So this means that you will need to assign healers to specific quadrants of the room to make sure that everyone is covered. Next for the tanking section, 
Early on in progression, most guilds who went with the no dispel strategy chose to use 3 tanks on this encounter, and the third tank was always a blood DK to supplement the additional grips to make ad management a little bit easier. This is no longer necessary in our opinion, and you can just use 2 tanks for this encounter. In the first phase when there's no ad alive, you will simply swap on 2 stacks, and you will want to make sure to use a defensive cooldown on the second application of the debuff because that will deal significantly more damage. Trinkets such as the Psychic Shell from Nizoth are extremely valuable on this fight because they just supplement your defensive cooldowns. In the first intermission, it doesn't matter which tank picks up the ad that spawns, but simply take him to the opposite organ of the raid, and that is just to make sure that the two tanks alternate kicks while the raid is DPSing down their assigned organ. Then once you transition back in the Ilganoth phase, you need to be aware of which tank actually has aggro on the ad. And whenever a tank swap is necessary, after the second application of the debuff from the boss, you should also swap aggro on the add. In the third intermission, when there's only one organ alive, both tanks should be playing around the center of the room and just playing a DPS role, killing the add that spawned and killing all the little bloods that are spawning, as well as trying to either get CC on them or try to group them up in a way where the DPS can deal with them a lot easier. At this point in the encounter, the area around the organ will be severely limited, especially if you have high number of melee DPS, so removing the two tanks from melee range of the organ just frees up some of that space. In the last Ilganaut phase, we recommend flipping the boss 180 degrees, so face him towards the back of the room instead of the front, and that will just free up a lot of space for the people who are normally standing in the back, or if you're doing the dispel strategy, then for your entire raid to use by the entrance. Because for the first three phases, that area was not usable by any of the DPS, it should be completely clear. Thank you so much for watching this video, and if you have any questions or even further tips, you can leave them in the comment section below. Thanks to Lozi and Shampi for helping me out with this video, and I'll see you guys on the next one. Bye bye.